Welcome, and hello, back to the Morbid Moonlight 31 Days of Halloween. You know the score by now, a new Felicia Rose film reviewed every day during the month of October, because I don't think enough people are really aware of quite how interesting Felicia Rose's career really is. Today, though, we're going to be moving on to 2017's Death House, and right up, I need to say that this is a movie where Felicia Rose basically just has a really small cameo, with only about one or two lines of dialogue. But see, the whole idea of doing the 31 Days of Felissa Rose is to look at Felissa Rose's career and the films that are important to her, but it's also just an excuse to talk about this eclectic bunch of strange little horror films that just happen to feature Felissa Rose in some capacity. And Death House is a film that really needs to be talked about, because it's just so fucking strange. Brought to us by Mr. B. Harrison Smith, director of two of my favourite Felissa Rose films, 2014's Count Dread and 2015's Zombie Killers, now, the phrase that turns up a lot in relation to Death House is that it's the expendables of horror, which in this case means it's a film with the most impressive list of genre names ever assembled, including the likes of Kane Hodder, Bill Moseley, Tony Todd, Dee Wallace, Barbara Crampton, Sid Haig, Michael Berryman, and lots, lots more. It's a horror fan's dream cast, basically, and the central idea is that of an ultra-high-tech security facility housing the world's most dangerous psychopaths, and this pair of young agents who get stuck inside when there's a power failure, and all the psychos get let loose. The suggestion is that because we've got all these awesome horror stars along, that there's going to be a familiar villainous face around every corner. The thing is though, Death House is many things, but what it isn't is the film that anybody expected it to be. It's not the expendables of horror by any means, but what it actually is is something that's a lot closer to maybe um, Grant Morrison's Batman Arkham Asylum, where it's less about a whole bunch of cool killers and crazy gore, and more about something that's a lot more kind of philosophical and ambitious, where things aren't maybe as straightforward as they seem, and a lot of what we see is more kind of metaphorical than it's meant to be literal. The Death House, like Arkham Asylum, is much more of this kind of metaphysical thing than literally just a big prison full of dangerous psychopaths, and it's a film that's much more interested in fairly highbrow conversations about the nature of good and evil than it is a simple Freddy vs. Jason style horror actor mashup. But now, I do admit it, there's a danger that because I like the director's other work, I'm being a lot more forgiving of Death House than I should be that I'm looking deeper than I normally would because of this whole, um, I think it's confirmation bias, you call it. Which is because I like Harrison Smith, I therefore have to like everything that he's done. I think that realistically, this is true to an extent, because I did find myself thinking about Death House way more than I should have, perhaps in an effort to try and understand why it's so fucking crazy. The thing is, Death House began life as an idea from Gunnar Hansen, um, the original Leatherface actor, who wanted to bring together the most impressive horror cast ever assembled, and after a long and difficult struggle to the screen, what we ended up with was something that kind of lost that ambition along the way. The first hurdle for a lot of people who saw Death House, and it's worth saying this now, that fan reaction to Death House is almost entirely negative, is in falling for that expendables of horror line and expecting 90 minutes of straightforward horror fan service. Now that's not what Death House is, and in actual fact I think that weirdly, the amazing horror cast is what actually holds Death House back, which seems like a pretty perverse hot take, but let me explain. Death House is a film that ultimately tries to have more substance than this simple kind of wham bam thank you ma'am, but the thing is that the best way to advertise a film like that isn't to promote it as a horror fan's wet dream just because it ends up underselling what it's actually going for, and despite received wisdom, there comes a point when getting 25 great actors for small cameos just to use their names to sell your film is worth less than getting 5 really great actors and actually giving them decent parts and using the fact that they're great actors and not just celebrities that turn up and do their bit. I mean, Adrian Barbeau, one of my all-time favourites, is in Death House doing a computerised voiceover, which is cool, but the movie isn't any the better because of that, despite what Easter egg obsessive internet fans might have you believe. Hidden nuggets of horror fan coded messages don't mean shit if your film's no good. For my money, Hatchet 3 is a film with a better all-star horror cast. You've got Caroline Williams, Daniel Harris, Sid Haig, Kane Hodder, Tony Todd and Derek Mears. Just because that is a film that applies the same kind of fanboy mentality to casting, but also takes the time to make sure that all of those great actors get decent parts that let them show off their skills, not just this elaborate game of spot the actor like you get with Death House. If Death House had abandoned the horror all-stars approach, then I think it would have worked better just because there wouldn't have been such a distraction from exactly what sort of a film it's trying to be. I mean, B. Harrison Smith talks about how a lot of viewers were expecting it to be this expendables of horror thing, then instantly hating it because that's not what it was. I think that is probably a valid point, and I can definitely see a lot of people reacting in that way, but I also think there's something that's more important going on here, which is maybe overlooked, which is the fact that whilst Death House obviously is not the film that most people thought it was going to be, it's actually not entirely sure what movie it does want to be. 
I listened to both Harrison Smith's DVD commentary and the episode of his cinema podcast devoted to Death House, and in both of them, he seems a little unsure whether this film is meant to be this kind of deeply metaphysical examination of the nature of evil that unfolds in this kind of weird dream logic type of way, or whether it's just meant to be a fun, knowingly silly roller coaster ride of a film. And I think that comes down to the fact that unlike his previous two films, Camp Dread and Zombie Killers, Death House isn't through and through a B. Harrison Smith film, but instead a film that he's been brought to as a hired gun. He's definitely tried to make it his own, but unfortunately, he's still basically a director for hire instead of a true indie altering his own stuff. And whilst it's hard to imagine any horror fan turning down the chance to work with such an amazing cast on such a cool sounding project, it's easy to see how this could have been just a cynically made piece of exploitation. The problem is that no matter what Death House is trying to be, whether it's something intellectual or something goofy, a cool gore fest or a tense sci-fi thriller, horror mashup or a metaphysical journey through the nine circles of hell, it just doesn't do a good job of any of those things because it never commits one way or another. It's like each scene doesn't know what the rest of the film is doing, like this cobbled together patchwork of scenes shot with whatever cool horror stars happen to be around that day. Each scene seems like it's trying really hard to do what it's doing, but a lot of the time you're still struggling to see how everything fits together. It also doesn't help that, unlike the naturalistic flow of the dialogue in Harrison Smith's other film, all the dialogue here is trying to sound kind of weighty and intellectual, where people speak in very weird, self-important monologues that don't really hang together, and often actually manage to totally obscure whatever it is that's trying to be said. It's like the equivalent of watching a film that's in another language without subtitles, where you can kind of grasp the idea of what's going on, but it's often difficult to understand what's actually being said. It's also a film that chooses to keep a lot of its plot points on this kind of almost subliminal level that demands you scrutinise everything that's going on. But let me save you the trouble, because a lot of it's not actually explained in the film at all. It's such a weirdly dense, impenetrable film for something with such a simple premise that I can see why horror casuals were turned off. I'm definitely not saying you need to be this smart to understand this movie, but you do have to wonder why they chose to go the route that they did. As an exercise in storytelling, it fails completely, because there are lengthy expository scenes that convey absolutely nothing, even though they're trying to do so, just in a way that tries to maintain some kind of mystery. But generally, the feeling that you come away with isn't so much that knee-jerk thing of it's terrible because it's not what I expected. I mean, I think in a lot of ways it's a well-shot, well-made, very ambitious film with some really intriguing ideas in it. It's absolutely not boring, and it's definitely trying to be more than the cheapest and easiest way of doing what it sets out to do. The problem is that it's a film that's been rendered almost entirely incomprehensible through a combination of clunky, overly portentous dialogue and this kind of general feeling like there isn't enough room to flesh out a lot of these ideas. For example, the most disturbing scene in the whole film involving elaborate special effects makeup is an idea that should be pure classic horror, and it definitely does have a certain power to it. The thing is, it just doesn't seem to hit nearly as hard as it should do. I just get this really strong feeling of this being something great that's been chipped away and crunched up then spat out into this weird jumble of half-realised ideas and scenes that don't really connect and stupid moments sitting side by side with really interesting ones. I should say just now, something I've said a few times so far but is worth saying again, Death House reunites director B. Harrison Smith with composer John Avarisi once more providing the soundtrack, and I actually think that it could be the best soundtrack that John Avarisi's ever done, this really fantastic mix of dark brooding tension, icy sci-fi sound design, and kind of weightier emotional stuff uh, when it needs that. It's definitely way better than you'd expect for a film like this, to be honest. John Avarisi is an asset to any lower budgeted films because the guy really understands how to score, and I love his stuff more and more every time I hear more of it. But a brilliant soundtrack aside, I admit that I'm having a hard time really knowing what to make of a film like Death House because it almost entirely defies a rating because it's so fucking strange. I will fight anybody that says it's just a piece of shit, like I know a lot of people do, but I'd also question the faculties of anyone that says that it's a classic, because I think that it does fail to do a lot of what it sets out to do. It's a film that seems to have put a lot of its effort into small details, at the cost of creating something solid and cohesive that carries the viewer along, and allows them to actually want to dig deeper into what they're seeing. I don't want to tear this film down, because I've got to admit that I'm kind of fascinated by how strange it is, but it's quite a morbid fascination, I've got to admit. Just because for every cool idea or concept, there's also something to look at that just doesn't work at all. I love the fact that it isn't just this really basic mashup, but I also wish that Death House just had a better, clearer script focused more on doing less, but doing it more thoroughly, and had a cast of just a few stars, but actually used them properly. I mean, does it waste all these stars? It absolutely does, even though some of them get a good crack of the whip, most of them do not. 
This is definitely one of Felissa Rose's smallest parts, earning Death House a Felissa factor of 1 out of 10 for being almost completely unnecessary to the film, which is a shame considering how important Felissa Rose has been to B. Harrison Smith's work in general, and she's also served as a producer on just about all of his films to date, which suggests that they get on well together creatively. As for a rating for Death House, well, that's definitely a difficult one. Like I said, I do not hate it, and I certainly don't love it. I'm very intrigued by it, because it's such an oddity, it's such a strange concatenation of people and concepts, that it's strange to see how this is the finished product when all the ingredients seem so good. As fascinating as it is a piece of art, I think that the story of the film itself is more interesting than actually sitting down to watch the film, which just isn't that much fun with a lot of the knowingly goofy moments coming across as just plain stupid, but not in an entertaining way, and the high concept stuff kind of fails to explain itself well enough to justify going quite that deep with this. There's a kind of hokiness to some of the deadly earnest stuff in Death House that's kind of fun, just how deadly serious and pompous a lot of it is, but because it's actually trying to do some interesting stuff, it doesn't really register on the so bad it's good level. I think at the end of the day, all you can really say is that it's a very unique and very flawed film that's worth a watch, but will probably disappoint you no matter what you go into it expecting. Listen to the DVD commentary though, because that's a lot of fun, and the soundtrack is fucking brilliant, but as for the film itself, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go for a 4 out of 10, and I think that objectively, I'd even have trouble justifying that. But I'm glad that I've seen it, and I can assure Mr. Harrison Smith that it's not an apathetic 4 out of 10, but just a 4 out of 10 that respects what you're trying to do, but wishes that it'd just been a better film overall. And I think that's more than enough for today's instalment of the 31 Days of Felissa Rose. Thanks a lot for watching, hope you enjoyed it, consider subscribing, all that shit, and I will see you back here tomorrow with day number 13 of the 31 Days of Felicia Rose, and I hope that we'll see you there.